ask you to take your Bibles. Let's go over to Revelation chapter 5. The book of Revelation in chapter 5 this morning. Young couple moved into a new neighborhood, enjoying the newness of their home. They got up early. They're having their coffee in the morning each day, and it is just nice to call a place home. And as they're sitting there having their coffee and things are settling down, the woman is looking out her window and she notices her neighbor is putting out her laundry. And as she sees her doing that, she says to her husband, Man, that woman doesn't know how to do laundry. Look how dirty those clothes are. They look like they need some more uh, detergent or something. It's just they're just dirty and it's just wrong, you know. And this went on for a few weeks, you know. Every time the woman came out with her laundry, she, uh, she would say something about it. Man, she just somebody needs to tell her. She needs to change her detergent. And uh, so subsequently, you know, it just troubled her, but she never really said anything. But one morning she got up and she looked out and she says, well, there you go. Somebody, somebody helped her. Somebody showed her what was going on. She said to her husband, what do you suppose happened? He said, well, this morning I got up before you did and I cleaned our windows. And uh, so now, <laughs> yes, you know, it's funny the windows we look through. We look at our world and we don't remember. As dirty as it is out there, God's got a handle on everything. And for you and for me, we can see with clear eyes when we read the whole story. Because things are happening in our day, are they not? They just get the heart thrilled on one hand. And on the other hand, we find ourselves sighing and crying because the world in which we've uh, come along in, it seems to be losing a sense of itself, a sense of place. And things seem to be coming undone you have heard this past week of the various football teams and they're sitting down or not coming out during the national anthem, uh, kind of protesting across the board. And now we watch our games and wonder if, in fact, we can even do this anymore. It is something that if they're going to not cheer for our country, then I suggest people ought not cheer for their team. Just take your money and go home. It is what it is, and our world has lost a sense of what honor, dignity, and loyalty really is all about. And in our country, we have a lot to be thankful for, nevertheless, because we have been founded on uh, some very powerful and wonderful principles, have we not? It's all about the Word of God. It's plundering those great thinkers of ages past, and people have come together, and the conclusions were in the founding of our country that God is the one who reigns in the heavens, and that he, if he is honored, then God will honor the efforts of those who seek to honor him. For you, for me, we're seeing that those foundations that were laid are hugely powerful. For this onslaught that we've experienced in this country is such that uh, we would have thought it would have fallen a long time ago. But I just want to say to you, not as a prophet of doom, but as a student of Scripture, that fall it will. The Bible makes it very clear that man's ways are not God's ways. This country is in trouble. We're on a, a crash course, if you will. But I like to read the back of the book to remember what's really going on. I like to see through the glass cleanly so that I can understand what's really going on. God is in the, pres is in the process, if you will, of helping people around us get a clue that this world's in trouble. Those who are the guys who would be sitting on their uh, couches, leaning in, rooting for their team, cannot ignore what's going on. We can't ignore Florida. We can't ignore Texas. We can't ignore fires over on the West Coast. We can't ignore Yellowstone burgeoning, as it were, as, a, as what they call a super volcano. You and I are living in some... T uh, tremulous times, if you will. The nations are in distress. But God, listen, is on the throne. And that gives us great comfort. And so we give him a hand, will you? He's on the throne. He's on the throne. And he's got this thing under control. We've been looking at the book of Revelation because we need to remember what it is we're part of. And we are part of his story. And this story that he unfolds for us is set forth as at its culmination in, in the book of Revelation. 
We've looked at the first several chapters, chapters 1 through 4, which means that as the divine outline set forth in chapter 1 and verse 19, that we've already looked at the things which John had seen, which were in chapter 1. We've looked at the things which are, which was chapters 2 and 3, which had to do with the church age in a panoramic uh, setting forth. And in chapter 4, we entered into the throne room of God. It is good to enter into the throne room of God. The Bible says, come boldly to the throne of grace that you might obtain mercy and grace to help in time of need. You and I have access. But here what we have is not only access, but we also have a clear view of what's going on in God's heaven, in God's throne room. The Bible says in chapter 4 and verse 1 that John heard a voice saying, come up hither, and immediately he was caught up into heaven. And he got there and there was a throne that he saw. And one sat on the throne. And we saw all of the different things that were around that throne. We saw in chapter 4 that in the throne room of God, not only was there a throne sitter, and he was pictured as having certain colors connected to him, which if you go back and chase those colors in the Old Testament, you find one color speaks of, uh, Behold a son. The other color spoke of the son of my right hand. And the third color spoke of praise. <laughs> so you don't get any more description than colors of who's on that throne. But if you connect the dots, it's Jesus sitting on that throne. Uh, we see him high and lifted up in Isaiah 6. And we see him in Ezekiel on the canopy. We see him here sitting on the throne. And what we see also is we see there were people around the throne. And there were 24 elders. I won't review all of these people, but just understand the 24 elders, that's us. That's the church. Each of us gets a chance to sit in the throne room of God throughout the eons of eternity. We'll come, we'll sit for a season, then we'll go on out and others will come in. But some of us, at any given time, there will be members of, church, of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ that will sit inside the throne room of God and bask in His glory and cry out holy with the angels. We will be able to take in that which is unthinkable. The Bible says that when we see Him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We're going to see him. Chapter 22, it says that we're going to see God face to face. We're going to see him. This means that what happens in Genesis where Adam and Eve were walking with God in the cool of the day will be ultimately restored in the future. And so we're coming to a time where we're going to be in that room with the Lord Jesus. There were living creatures, and we saw them as kind of reflectors of what was going on with that throne sitter. They had four faces, and we'll talk about them again in a minute. But we also saw that these were the ones who had six wings. And it says in chapter 4, verse 8, they said, Holy, holy, holy. And if you connect the dots through Scripture, you see these are the seraphim of Isaiah 6 uh, that were crying, Holy, holy, holy. And we see that they are also connected right here in clarity uh, with being in the throne room as being with those four beasts that Ezekiel specifically saw in the canopy uh, that actually carried the Lord along in uh, near the river or brook Jabbar. And so the Bible tells us in chapter 5 that this scene begins to, continues I should say, to unfold. In verse 1, as he's seen these the throne sitter, the beasts and the elders and all the angels and so forth, verse, five, uh, verse 1 of chapter 5 says, and I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne, a book written within and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. Now know this, if you haven't done it yet, it might be good for you to do it here, because this is where things begin to move in a direction that you might say the music would change on. Things are going to go a little ominous from here on out. And if you would circle the word seven, it will be a reminder to you that there's going to be sevens throughout this book. Uh, there were seven churches. There's the seven spirits of God. There's the seven seals. Of the seventh seal, there's going to be seven trumpets and seven bold judgments. And it's sevens all around. Okay, so what we're seeing here is right away we're seeing a book or a scroll. It's written within and on the back side. Now, for you and for me, this is cryptic if we don't know what the rest of the Scripture says. But there are several places in the Old Testament uh, where we see this scroll or a scroll mentioned. One of them is in Zechariah and chapter 5. 
In verses 1 and 2, if you're prone to write these down for study later, uh, you might do well. In Zechariah chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, we find Zechariah being given a series of visions. It's called the uh, Apocalypse of the Old Testament. Zechariah is called the Apocalypse of the Old Testament because of all the visions. Well, in chapter 5 and verse 1 and 2, uh, he sees a flying scroll. It actually is called a roll there, which is how a scroll is. It's rolled up. But he sees a flying scroll or a flying roll. And in that particular scene, what he saw was he saw two things that are pertinent to our discussion here. It says in this verse, in chapter 5 here in Revelation, that it was written within and on the back side. This is something that Zechariah saw as well. And in his uh, vision, he saw writings on the front and on the back of this flying roll, and the one side had to do with stealing, and the other side had to do with swearing. And he says, that, and, and in that vision, he was telling, he was being told that there was an ominous sense of judgment written on that roll. So there's a connectivity to this being written on the front and on the back. And when it says uh, stealing, what was being stolen in their day is not unlike what's being stolen in our day. You see, in their day, Israel was in deep trouble. And as a result of their deep trouble, uh, it, it, it had become something of a, what, may, what we might call the, the, the rule of the day was to spread lies, okay, and, and to give people the wrong uh, information. And there was a stealing going on of truth. And that's what's happening in our day. Everything from global warming to evolution to, uh, to the existence of God. Uh, everything to the distinctions of males and females. Everything from the confines, from the barriers of right and wrong. It's been stolen. And on one side, this, this scroll had written about stealing. And then on the other side was swearing. Interesting word in the Old Testament, swearing. The word means sevens. <laughs> It means to seven oneself. Think about that. To seven oneself is to sell a lie so long that you begin to believe it. It's a perfect number, seven. To seven oneself is to take an oath to the point where you actually fall in. The world in which we live really does believe a lot of the nonsense that's been foisted on them, whether it be on the news media of our day or whether it come from the halls of learning in our day. Uh, these riots we see at the halls of higher learning across our country are the result of a lot of professors that have sevened themselves. They believe what they're saying. Don't doubt it. They believe it because you say this lie a long time and you begin to believe it. You begin to live in accordance with it. Interestingly enough, their lies have become so profound and so prevalent that many of them have been exhausted by the culmination of the lies to the point where they're saying, well, you know, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> they can't continue the narrative, but they must, or they might lose their position. I would, ex I would uh, suggest that you look up uh, Ben Stein's video called Expelled on YouTube, and you'll see what happens to professor who, professors who break rank. Expelled on YouTube. It's called Expelled, Ben Stein. And what you can do is you can see how if you break rank and you begin to say something other than what is commonly accepted as true, uh, you begin to lose tenure and actually positions in higher learning. It will lead to a lot of bad things. It will lead to the, uh, the, 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 the vilification of the righteous. Let me give you an illustration of that. Uh, first of all, I would reference for you the judges who didn't go along with Obergefell. If good, solid, sound, godly judges were told you have to do a uh, gay wedding, as justices sometimes overdo the justice of the peace thing, if they were not willing to do that, they would have to recuse themselves completely from the bench, thus vilified. What about the issue of people who, if you don't, uh, if you don't serve uh, in a homosexual wedding, whether it be by floral arrangements or by making cakes or taking photographs because it's against your religion, you can lose your job. And many have. You've been, people have been sued. Right now there's a case before the Supreme Court of, of one bakery guy. Uh, he is on, on the docket uh, in this fall season. So that's why I say pray for our Supreme Court that Kennedy will resign as well as Ginsburg. You, you, we've got, a, we've got a, a lot of opportunity here, but whether God will pull it all back or not, I don't know. 
My point is this, the lie, the lie, the lie, the scroll, front stealing, uh, the other side uh, swearing. There's a lot of pervasive lying. The Bible says, woe be unto a people who call good evil and evil good. This is what we are arriving at as we speak. In your local schools now, you're seeing signs along the side of the road, vote for so-and-so because he wants to be on the school board or he wants to be a trustee. It means more than it ever has. The church needs to rise up, and it did in Alabama, where Judge Moore was elected. Uh, people of good faith wo uh, woke up, went to the polls, and in spite of all of the money thrown at it, $30 million were thrown at this by the uh, Republican establishment. And, he, and, and Judge Moore won, nevertheless, by uh, 10 points. Judge Moore was one of the people who lost his job for saying the right thing and not pulling the Ten Commandments down. This is the world we're living in. Now, I'm putting contemporary things with future things because you need to realize they're not that far removed from each other. <laughs> okay, this is where we are. If America falls, there's no place to go. If there was any place better, people would be going there. And they can take their jackhammers and hit the, the foundation of this country all day long, but if they really believed what they say they believe, they'd go somewhere else. And I will pay for the ticket of a number of them as far as I can afford it. And, and, because I just tell you, go, please, go. Just leave us alone. And uh, we're, we're looking at a time in which uh, these things are coming into their own. Now, the, there, there's another place in the Old Testament that deals with this uh, scroll idea. And that would be in Ezekiel chapters, uh, chapter 2 and verses 9 and 10. And in that particular vision, Ezekiel sees a scroll, and in it was written lamentations, mourning, and woe. You can write those words down or just look them up later. Lamentations, mourning, and woe. This is what this has uh, connected with it. So when you see a scroll in a prophetic vision, you can connect it to those two places, uh, but also understand that this is connected to the book of Revelation very deliberately because this scroll is in the hand of the throne sitter. And if you were to jump over in your book, in your Bible, uh, to chapter 10 of Revelation, just flip the page, really, in my Bible is all I have to do. The Bible says in chapter 10 and verse 1, I saw a mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head. His face was, as it were, the sun. These are all pictures of deity. The rainbow, the crown, was like, it was like a crown. He's, he's clothed with a cloud, which is what Ezekiel saw. And his face shone like the sun. This was, this, and he's a mighty, he's huge. And the Bible says in verse 2 that he had in his hand a scroll. And now it's open because the six seals are going to be popped by this point. And there he is. He's going to be standing with a scroll in his hand. And he has one foot on the sea and one foot on the earth. Which tells us that this is also connected to what Jeremiah shows us of a scroll when Jeremiah was told to go purchase some land before the uh, exile of the people of God uh, and the, the, dev uh, the devastation of Ju Jerusalem. And he was told to take this scroll, which was a title deed for some land, because he was to buy it before Jerusalem fell as a promissory example to everybody who was watching that, yes, I've said it's going to fall, but I'm still going to buy land because Jesus is going to make sure we get it all back. <laughs> okay? And he did, at length, let them come back. So it was a title deed. So you have woes, you have lamentations, you have mourning, you have people lying, you have people stealing, you have a title deed. This scroll is a profoundly important scroll. It is central to chapter 5. In, his, in the right hand of him that sat on the throne was a book written within and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. Verse 2 says, And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? That's a question, isn't it? Because really, when you have something sealed, that means that nobody but those to whom it is addressed or who had the right could open or break those seals. When a king sealed uh, some kind of a document, that made it ratified. When a scroll was rolled up in the Roman times, 
they could they made it such that you could seal it different sections. So one seal's broken, it would unfurl to some degree, and then another seal would be broken. So there's a continuation of breaking of seals to get the body of the information inside of a scroll in the Roman days. Such is the case here. This is a sealed scroll with seven seals, but the question is posed, who is worthy to open the book? Now, when it says that there was a strong angel proclaiming in verse 2, many would connect this with Gabriel. We only really know of two angels in the Bible by name, and that would be Gabriel and Michael. Michael is known as the protector angel, the angel of protection over Israel, and Gabriel is the proclaiming angel. He's the one that told Mary she was going to have a son. Holy Ghost was going to come upon her, and that which was born of her would become the Savior. You and I see this guy proclaiming, this angel proclaiming with a loud voice, and the proclamation is, who is worthy? Now, the word proclaiming is the word caruso. Think of a herald back in the day. If you can imagine some of the movies you've seen where somebody's come out on some kind of a, of a stand somewhere in the midst of a crowd and just, you know, maybe trumpets have gotten everybody's attention and he stands somewhere in the, alone as everybody falls silent and he cries out, uh, who is worthy to open uh, the scroll? Who is worthy to loose the seals? All of heaven stands silent. It's like when mom or dad came home and you were doing wrong. <laughs> they walked in and everybody just stopped. You could hear a pin drop because nobody was worthy. Nobody was found. Verse 3 says, And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the scroll or the book, neither to look thereon. Now understand this is huge because uh, what we're beginning to see here is that heaven was left speechless for a moment. No one was found. There might have been a rustling. There might have been a looking to the guy to the left or to the right. But we're, what we're told is no one was found. It kind of reminds me of when the inkhorn angel showed up with the judging angels in the book of Ezekiel at the temple, uh, that the Lord said, stay your hand, you judging angels, while I take the inkhorn angel and let him go seal everybody in the city who sighs and cries, because there's going to be a great slaughter. But the one who sighs and cries, they're going to be sealed. They're not going to be suffering a slaughter today. And he got, he got the, the inkhorn angel was sent, and he was back immediately. <laughs> so he went ahead to go all the way through Jerusalem before they did the great slaughter. But after the inkhorn angel had sealed everyone that was to be sealed, there was indeed a great slaughter. But it happened quickly that this inkhorn angel went and came back. Now, that could either mean that it, there was very few and he only had to go over to the ones down the road and around the corner in that house and that was it. Sort of like Rahab was the only one in the room in Jericho. Or it could mean that time really doesn't mean a whole lot in, uh, in, the, in the vernacular that we think of. But what we see here is that no man was found. And it says it took over, they, that they searched throughout heaven, throughout earth, and under the earth. They looked everywhere. But no man could be found to be able to do this. And the Bible says in verse 4 that John writing says, And I wept much. The word wept here is creo. It means I wailed. I wailed. I wailed. Now you and I don't really understand that except maybe every now and then in our world because we live in a pretty, uh, you know, fenced-in world, you know, we don't see people devastated like sometimes, but maybe you've seen somebody depicted in a, in a, in a hospital finding out their, their beloved has been taken through some tragedy, or maybe you've seen some war show where somebody has been killed by the enemy and it was their loved one or whatever. The concept here is that kind of a wailing. It's from the, from the depths of one's despair. And what I see here is something that is good for us to remember. In heaven, every emotion is going to be amplified. And he's looking and he sees it and he doesn't know what's in it. Nobody knows what's in it. But do you know what he wants? He wants to know what's in it. I want to ask you this morning, do you want to know what's in this? I want to know more. And the more I read this, the more I want to know more. And you know what's so cool is we're at the end of the line here, and the book is unsealed. 
We now can look. But what I want you to know is that in heaven, every motion you have is going to be amplified. And what's cool about that is the Bible says there's not going to be any more sorrow. <laughs> so let's just get that out of the way right now. There's not going to be any sickness, parting pain, because old things are going to pass away and all things are going to become new and every joy you've ever experienced is going to be amplified to the point where you, if you had this mortal body to try to contain it, you'd just pop, okay? It would just be a little pop and done because it's going to be so good. And that's what I would take, for this, uh, take from this for my heart, is that in glory, it's going to be literally bliss. And we're just going to be... <laughs> but right here, he's looking down the corridors. He's not in them to stay. He's looking and he wails. He wept much... And the Bible says, because no man was found worthy to open the, and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, weep not. Now, I got his pause here. If you underline that word elder, that's one of the members of the church. You uh, may remember the, the movie Shrek when they were looking for somebody to go take care of the ogre or something. He's got the donkey. Pick me! Pick me! <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't you like to be the guy to lean over to John in retrospect? You know, just kind of all this kind of future and past and present converging and saying, don't weep. We, Jesus has got this. <laughs> okay. It's okay, John. Don't weep. Do not weep. You don't have to. Because there, though there are no, there is no man who's found in heaven or in earth or under the earth. The Bible says in verse five, "Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof." Thing to take away at that point is the knowledge that lamentations, mourning, and woe is part of what's in this scroll. And John wants that. He wants that. If you've ever known somebody who's had to have some kind of dire surgery and it scared everybody in the family, you know, there comes a point where you say, just do it. Just take care of it. Just get it done. And you know, for the believer, we do not rejoice when the wicked are destroyed. We're, we rejoice when evil is done away with. But the wicked, no one would wish upon their worst enemy the everlasting destruction, which will be the part, uh, a portion of the wicked. Look in your Bibles to chapter 14, would you please? Chapter 14 of Revelation. You and I need to be very familiar with uh, this. The Bible says that when those who take the mark of the beast and finally end up being damned for all eternity. In verse 10, it says that those that take the mark will drink of the wine. This is chapter 14 and verse 10. They will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of His indignation. Now think about that. This is unmixed wrath. God's wrath, who's the one who created everything, this is unmixed, undiluted wrath. They're going to have to absorb undiluted wrath. The Bible says in verse 10, it says they will, uh, they will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of His indignation, and He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And lest we think somehow that there's an annihilation, you know, that they're going to be burned up and done, he qualifies it further. Verse 11 says, They shall have no rest, day or night, who worship the beast and who receive the mark of his name. You understand, though, this is not just for those who take the mark. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 1, that the evil and the wicked and the ungodly are going to be turned into hell and they will, uh, uh, they will endure what the Bible calls everlasting destruction. We, we have a slogan that is not only on the bumper stickers that people have, but it's also written across the hearts and minds of our generation. And that slogan is, No Fear. Now, if you're lost, 
You better fear. Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We need to go back and remember the Bible didn't change just because man got an iPad. Okay? It's still real. He's coming and he ain't going to be happy. Once you're born again, the Bible makes it very clear that we can get a new bumper sticker. And our bumper sticker for the believer is, fear not. <laughs> fear not! Because he's the one who overcame in chapter 5. The Bible says, and one of the elders said, Weep not, because the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed. The word for prevailed here is Nike. <laughs> okay, you got your Nikes on this morning? The word means to prevail. It means to conquer. It means to be a winner. It comes from the Greek word nikao, and it's the idea of his winning, his prevalence, his conquest. He has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals, uh, the seven seals thereof. What an amazing God we serve. He not only took care of everything, but he took care of everything uh, all across the board in spades and beyond. Do you know what Jesus did on the cross? Not only paid for your sins and mine, but the Bible says he died not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. That is amazing. He didn't just die for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. Jude talks about false teachers. And the false teachers, he says, they deny the Lord who bought them. They were paid for. It is not a limited atonement. It is sufficient. God loved the whole world so much that He gave His only begotten Son. We stand up close. We're like the elders this morning, sitting around the throne, looking at the Lord Jesus. He's called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. I've only had the opportunity of hearing a lion roar one time, and I think the Lord gave that to me just so I could tell you about it. We had gone to the zoo here about two or three years ago, down in Columbus, and they're always sitting there just flopping their tails, looking like you could go up and lay on them and, you know, roll around with them and have fun. Evidently, it was feeding time, but we didn't know it. They were still flopping their little tail, looking all chill, you know, looking chill, as they say today. But when we walked away, I was probably about a third of a block away. Couldn't see him anymore. That lion roared, and it shook me to the core. The whole park rumbled when he roared. It blew my mind. I mean, all I saw was on the TV screen, little cat going, roar. That's all I've ever seen of a lion roaring. This thing roared in, in Columbus, and it went down to the core. It rumbled my core. He's the lion. And you know, when he's ready to pull the trigger, in this great season of apostasy, of sinfulness, of days like the days of Noah, of violence, days like the days of Lot, of decadence and, and, and just degrading behaviors, when he roars, you know things are bad. Because he does not rejoice in the destruction of the wicked. God would not have any to be perished, but that all would come to repentance. God's judgment is His strange work. God loves mercy. God loves mercy. And in fact, all of the tribulation is a chronic altar call. If you go back to chapter 10 with me for a second, I'll show it to you. Revelation chapter 10. Actually, it's chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14 says in verse 7, that an angel went across the heavens saying with a loud voice, this is to the population of the earth. An angel literally pops through and says this to the population of the earth. Fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment has come and worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. Now, you may think that that just sounds redundant, but at this point in the tribulation, when this angel shows up, a third of the vegetation has been burned up. A third of the fresh water has been destroyed. A third of the ocean and the, and the fish of the ocean have been destroyed. Actually, it's more, like a, it's more, more than that because it's a third and a third. And it's, it's this huge amount, and people are thirsty. And the sun is burning people. 
because of the heat of the sun, because the, evidently somehow the atmosphere is going to be a little bit more hostile than even it can be in some of the harshest parts of the world today. And so when this angel shows up, it's an altar call. And God even modifies his own modus operandi in that he allows an angel to show up and cry out to the people. And that was right before he says, whoever takes the mark. He says, do it because you take the mark. This is where you're going. You don't want to do that. And if I haven't convinced you with fire from heaven and brimstone and all the stuff that you've seen, you know, then, then you're going to go ahead and go be damned. But that's not my do- desire. God is not willing that any should perish. Do you know men in their left to themselves, are insolent. They are rebellious. And it was in all of us. We know this. This is why we can't cast stones. But for the grace of God, there we would be. In shame, I hear my mocking voice cry out among the scoffers. That was me. I don't say these things from a ivory tower. I say these things because they are what are true of me and of each one of us, but that God in His grace and mercy had brought to our attention some things we needed to know. And I believe with all my heart He brings to every man's attention things they need to know. But if they resist, listen, if they seven themselves, if they make an oath in their hearts that I will not go to God. The Bible says God gives them up. Referred to as a reprobate mind and thereafter as dogs and brute beasts because they no longer have a conscience. The Bible says their conscience gets seared as with a hot iron. There's a callousness. But where there's breath, there's hope. You may have heard this past week that Hugh Hefner died. Now, I don't know if any pulpit's going to say this, but he's got a lot of explaining to do. He put into motion the breaking down of barriers and of dignity and decency. He started it. And God, in His mercy, let him live 91 years. Mercy because even God Let that man stay alive before he had to go where he was destined to go. You think about that. That's mercy. So no matter where people are on the continuum, that man destroying a culture from within, that's how Rome fell and that's how we're falling, we're finding that he gave him 91 years to change his mind and change his way. But he had been given up. And you and I now see each person will go the way of all flesh. The Bible says that the elder told John that the lion of the tribe of Judah had prevailed. He's also called the root of David. That's important because he's usually referred to as the branch. But here he's the root because he's God. He's the one who started David. (laughs) He's the one that's underneath David. He's the supreme ruler of heaven and earth. He's the omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent God. He's the one who over... He's over eternity. He's over time. He's beyond time. And he's the one who put David where David was. He's the reason for our David. And he's the root... And he has, prepared, he has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals of that book. So what we've seen up to this point in verses 1 to 5 is a proclamation. We could say proclamations because the one said, who shall? And the other said, he shall. So you got two proclamations going. Who shall prevail to open? He shall prevail to open. And Jesus is the one who has the right and the wherewithal, and the authority, and the strength of heart. We have a song we sing sometimes. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. But I want you to know that Him coming meek and lowly doesn't mean that He's faint of heart. (laughs) He is not faint of heart. He has the wherewithal, the capacity, the right, and the intention... To pull the trigger 
on unfurling this, this scroll. And the Bible says in verse 6, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, notice that says in the midst, where is the Lamb? He's in the midst of the throne. Think about that. He's not in front of the throne, beside the throne. He's in the midst of the throne because he was granted, the Bible says, to sit in the Father's throne. Revelation 3.21 says, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. Jesus is in the midst of the throne. Verse 6 says, Lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and of the elders, and, and in the midst of the elders... That gives us a picture of these 24 elders who are not just sitting in front of the throne, but they're kind of around, it would seem. We get a little bit more vision of who they are where they're sitting. But he's there, and it says, stood. That's interesting, because the Bible says he was to be seated until his enemies were made his footstool in the book of Acts. The lamb, standing, it says it stood a lamb as it had been slain. And that's important because we don't want to say as if, because he was. The word for slain here is the word slaughtered. It's the word slaughtered. Do you ever think of Jesus as being slaughtered? That's the concept. I was thinking about how, you know, you can take a hardened criminal and you can put him before the bar of the judge. And that judge passes a verdict of death upon that man. And for a moment, he probably, because of the way that we are wired not to ever consider such things as our own death, especially in verdicts, we always think somebody's going to come through. But as the verdict comes down that he will be executed on thus and thus a day, that that man begins to have that seep in that he was going to die. When truth about our sin comes to us, we realize we have a death sentence. The Bible says the wages of sin, sin is death. We have a death sentence. But unless the Spirit of God drives that home, that that's who we are, we might not really appreciate what's going to follow hereafter in my, in my thought. But what I see is a man, he's before bar, and he's been told that he is going to be killed, he's going to be executed for his crimes. And then along comes a man who comes from the back, Let's, let's, let's make it something a little bit more visceral. Hi, Mom. It's his mother walks in. And she says, I'll die for him. You put in who you want, but that person is beloved by the criminal. And they walk down and they said, I'll do it. And this maybe this guy's laughing under his sleeve. Man, they're never going to kill them. That's my mom. That's my dad. They've never done anything wrong. But they don't wait as he's walking out the door. They begin to hit her and kick her and slap her and take knives and cut her arm. He stopped short because this is serious business. Jesus was slaughtered for you and me. It wasn't a small deal. He was a lamb slaughtered. For your sin and mine, and if you look at it, it blows the sensibilities away. But we're able to quickly look at something else. The TV, the radio, the songs, real life, good food. No, he was a lamb who had been slain. And no matter how hardened the criminal would be if he saw him for who he was, he was more important and more precious than his mother or his father or his brother or his best friend. Do you think that would change him? You'd think. But in the day of Laodicea, people sing about it like... Only you are worthy of my praise. Songs like that. We don't think. Don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with the songs of our day, by and large. But when we've turned church into a party, we've lost something of this. 
important centerpiece. A lamb slain. Sin serious. Death penalty pronounced. Everlasting destruction. Torment day and night. We can't keep looking the other way. The Bible says he beheld in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Understand, the seven horns, horns speak of kingdoms. It's going to come up again later. Uh, There's going to be a beast with seven horns who thinks he's been in charge. But right here we're found, we find that he, Jesus, is the one who raises up one, puts down another. Romans chapter 10 tells us that he is the one who, uh, the powers that be are ordained of God. If God gave us a Pharaoh, if God gave us a Nebuchadnezzar, if God gives us a Caesar, if God gives us a president, if God gives us a prime minister in our various sectors of the world, God gave them. And you've got to ask why we've been given some of the ones we've been given. But regardless of all the answers to that question, God raises up one and he puts down another. That's what happens. And what we see is it says he had seven horns. And there were seven, uh, seven kingdoms that have been enumerated. Daniel talked about them and the book of Revelation will talk about them. And I'll not enumerate them until we get there. But there are seven universal kingdoms. I've mentioned a few of them already. But what we see is he has seven horns, which means he's the sovereign over all the earth. He always has been. He is, in fact, and always has been, the king of kings. When you think of him being the king of kings, think about that for a moment. You see, the Bible says the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. He turns it whithersoever he will. So when he turns it to take and open our borders back a few years ago. God did that. Why? When He turned it to champion restrooms being obliterated as far as distinctions, when He turned it in these people, why? Why did He turn it? Why? Because those people asked for it. And God is what we might call the ultimate or consummate gentleman. He will not force people. And because our country has asked for it, asked for it, asked for it, and I should say, and because the church has asked for it, asked for it, asked for it, we've gotten it. We don't want to be judged. Don't judge me. Who are you to judge me? And that's in the church too. I read this past week that the Mennonite church, when you think of a Mennonite church, don't you think of something very conservative? The Mennonite church this past week ordained the first female lesbian pastor as senior pastor. Now, I know there's branches of Baptists and there are branches of different denominations, and I don't know what the branch is, but it made news. The first female lesbian to be ordained as a senior pastor of a Mennonite assembly. Where'd that come from? It came from the heart of men who wanted it. Somebody was saying, that's a good thing, let's do it. Because they forgot the Word of God. They forgot the wages of sin. They forgot everlasting destruction. The Bible says that he, is, he has these horns and he has these eyes. And the Bible says that they're sent forth in verse 6. So this, this, the game is already afoot. The Bible talks about the Holy Spirit being sent by Jesus. He said it is important that I go away. In verse uh, 26 of chapter 15 in the book of John, it says, When the Comforter does come, whom I will send unto you from my Father... He will proceed from the Father. He will testify of me. Chapter 16 of John in verse 7. And this is John writing in Revelation 2. So this is his writing as well. He says uh, in chapter 16, verse 7, he says, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away, meaning as his crucifixion and ascension. The Comforter, if I don't go away, the Comforter will not come. But if I depart, I will send him. Jesus sends the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2 and verse 33, on the day of Pentecost, they're wondering what's going on. The Bible says that Peter stood up in the midst of them and he says, God having highly exalted Jesus and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, Jesus sent forth, shed forth this which you now see, which were the miracles of speaking in foreign languages. Let's be clear. It wasn't gibberish. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't chaos. It wasn't batalagia like the heathen do. Jesus said, when you pray, don't pray as the heathen do. In vain repetitions, bata, 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 bata It was languages. We hear every man in our own, not language only, but dialect. 
So one was Southern, and one was saying it in a different way from a different part of the world, whether it was Australian accent or a UK accent. They got all kinds. They heard them in their own language. But Jesus shed forth. And here it says they're sent. It's already happening. It's already unfolding. And in chapter 7, we're going to see many are going to get saved during the tribulation. Verse 7 says that Jesus, this lamb, this lion, he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. You say, well, I thought you said it was Jesus. It is, but he's sitting with his father in that throne. <laughs> okay, so you got, you got this, this glimpse of the reality of the Trinity that you don't get quite as clearly. You see it at the baptism, right? Son was baptized, the Spirit descended, and the Father spoke. How do, you, how do you slice and dice that? I can't tell you. I just know I see it everywhere. Ha, ah, you lied to God, Ananias and Sapphira. How is it that you lied to the Holy Spirit? He that has seen me, says Jesus, has seen the Father. So he's the throne sitter, but he's also there with his Father. I'm going to need to stop. I know you don't want me to, but we need to stop for time's sake. But I want you to know this. He wailed because he wanted more. Our appetite for the Word of God says a lot about us, doesn't it? If you don't want to know what's in the last part of the book, it's to be questioned whether you're really familiar too much with what's in the first part of the book. Because he who will come, shall come, and he will not tarry. Jesus said, when I come, I come quickly. It's going to be like tacos. It's going to be speedily. And when he was seen by John in chapter 5... He's seen as the one who's going to break some seals. And when those seals get broken, literally, all hell is going to break loose on this earth. Would you bow with me for a moment?